What's good? How y'all doing this afternoon? Welcome back to the Dunn's favorite here on Forever I Love Atlanta Sports Podcast. It's your boy, the Dunn. I'm here to talk about Terry Fortinot. Not, I'm saying it wrong. Terry Fortinot. All right. Um, I got on <clears throat> my partner in crime, Mad Mike from Mad Mike Sports AFN. How you doing, man? Hey, man. I'm cool. I'm chilling. Um, uh, I'm feeling kind of. I don't even know what to say about this. I think this is like uh, the hamburger. You know what I'm saying? The hamburger. We just stole. We just stole Terry Fontenot you know, away from the Saints. Like I'm, I'm feeling good about that, man. I think this is. I, I think this is a well calculated, brilliant idea for Arthur yeah. Blake. Um, for that purpose, we're gonna get to that purpose. Um, but I, I feel like I, I think this is a good move, man. I really do think this I, is. A brilliant. I, I agree. I agree. We've been talking about this for a long time. And we brought on another, no other than Ross Jackson from uh, Canal Street Chron- Chronicles. How you doing, man? Let everybody know uh, who you are, where they can find you. Doing great, man. I hey, appreciate y'all having me on. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about this Terry Fontenot hire, but uh, I, I agree with Mike. Y'all should feel very, very positive uh, about this. Uh, y'all can follow me on Twitter at Ross Jackson, NOLA, N-O-L-A. Uh, you can check out the work over at Canal Street Chronicles as well as the daily work over at the Locked on Saints podcast. Glad to be able to come through today and help talk about this hire for y'all. I appreciate you. Thank That's you so incredible. much. <clears throat> so, Terry Fortnite. All right, he's been with the organization – for 16 years, all right? This is before Breeze was there. This is when y'all yep. had Aaron Brooks as y'all quarterback. <laughs> y'all had Deuce McAllister as y'all running back. Y'all Woo! had uh, – y'all had – I forgot the coach name. Uh, oh, Jim Hazlitt. Jim yeah, Hazlitt. Yeah, yeah. yeah, y'all had Hazlitt as y'all uh, quarterback. Man, as y'all head coach. Mm-hmm. So, they tell me about, you know, <clears throat> the early, you know, beginning of the tear front not, uh, with the uh, organization. Yeah, so he started off with the organization uh, basically on in a couple of different roles, but he's always been somebody that has had his hand in pro personnel, pro scouting. He's always sort of been in that in that range, uh, in that level, and so he that's really where he sort of made his footprint with this team, especially as of late and over the recent years. He has seen the the worst of the franchise uh, and the best of the franchise as well. He's been around for all of it. He's been a huge part of sort of the upswing here uh, recently in terms of what the team has been able to do, particularly not even in terms of talking about what they do on the field, just talking about in terms of them being able to identify, recruit, and retain talent at the pro scouting level and at the pro personnel level. Mm -hmm. All right. So that's his for that's his expertise is the pro scouting, mm-hmm. pro yes. personnel. All right. So our this is the Falcons issue for the most part. And yes, we have issues with evaluating talent on the pro scouting as well. We brought in mm-hmm. guys like Terrell McLean. Right. You guys, <laughs> man, man, you know what I'm talking about. We get these guys in here, man. <laughs> they are absolutely <laughs> trash. Look at Dante Come Fowler. On. We decided this man for 15 million dollars. Mm-hmm. And this man have not produced at all none this year. Yeah, yeah. So, this is the, the yeah the the Dante Fowler signing was one of the things that I pointed to and said this is why Atlanta is hiring Terry Fontenot, or this is why Atlanta is hire uh, or pursuing Terry Fontenot. I, I wasn't early enough on it, but I know when they start. I wasn't as early as y'all on it, but when it started off towards like you know they you you saw the talks and everything about hey Terry Fontenot is getting some traction in Atlanta. All this stuff. It made perfect sense because you look at some of these some of these signings, and I would even say the acquisition of uh, of Todd Gurley kind of plays into that as well. Because Terry Fontenot, one of the other things that he that he's a part of, not that the signing of Terry uh, that Todd Gurley was bad, but just the contract and figuring out what the weight of that all was going to be. That's more of a Rams problem than it is a Falcons problem. Yeah. But it's those types of issues that you see around the league that Terry Fontenot helps the New Orleans Saints sort of avoid when it comes to figuring out people that are not only like going to produce on the field and that are going to fit the system. Like he has an idea of what the philosophy is for these players that are around the NFL and who's going to fit, but also contract negotiations, talks, uh, the, the, the talks uh, about the contract negotiations, getting all that stuff in place, the retention once those players get to the team. He's a big part of that as well in terms of that's why you don't see a lot of in-house free agents leave from New Orleans with the exception of guys like maybe Tyler Davison, who was, you know, an undrafted free agent. They didn't have the room for him, but he ended up with with the Atlanta Falcons, for instance. Uh, He's a big part in that identification and that part of it as well. And then one of the other things that I'll mention, too, that I think is important to the Atlanta Falcons as the, the build continues 
for Atlanta because I always look at Atlanta as a team that's never rebuilding but always kind of reloading. And yes. Perry Fontenot is a big part of that when it comes to like that pro personnel look. And he's able to do that with uh, not only free agency but also trade acquisitions, waivers. And then he's the guy that brings folks in once they get drafted and they become a part of the system. He's a big part of that identification role, fit, all of that other stuff. All right, so pretty much to yeah. sum up, let me let me let me break this down for for people who can't understand. <laughs> I know you were going, Doug. <laughs> look, hey. what he does, he look at players around the league, free agents or whatever. He look at what production and are they worth that amount of money? If not, right. they're not coming here. Mm-hmm. But if they are, then we'll bring them in. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And so he's really good with all that. And he's just really great at understanding what types of players fit the team philosophy. And he's looking at that, the team philosophy in terms of how they fit on the field, but also how they fit in the locker room. Like, what are these guys in terms of culture? What are these guys in terms of their ability to, to work with the other players around, everything like that? Like, the you, you hear a lot about the New Orleans Saints team culture, and Terry Fontenot is a big part of maintaining that throughout the, you know, once these players actually arrive in, you know, the facility or in Metairie in New Orleans, however you want to look at it. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Matt, Mike, you want to add to anything, ask a question? Um, would you say that, Terry is a guy that um, I wouldn't necessarily say with the you know philosophy, but mm-hmm. the Falcons have had a culture of not being a very tough type of uh, organization, and they're not very physical. Mm-hmm. Guys tend to speak up. Are you? Uh, is he one of those GM that? goes for a certain mentality as far as like a defensive side, offensive side of the ball. Yeah. So so this is where this is where the kind of new widening his scope as a general manager is going to come into play. This is where some of the question marks are because what Terry Fontenot is accustomed to is that somebody else sets the tone, somebody else sets the philosophy, and then he finds the players, the people, the staff, everything like that, that fits that. Okay. Now he has to widen his scope a little bit to where he's over pro personnel and he's working with the, with the folks that are, that are you know heads of that particular department. But he's also going to be working with the department that's mm-hmm. taking care of, let's say, college scouting, for instance, the players that are coming into the NFL, which are usually split with NFL franchises. He's also going to be you know, concerned with player retention as a whole, contract negotiation to a you know a greater extent he'll have his hands deeper in that he's learned from two of the best in kai harley and mickey loomis in terms of how to make these contracts work ghost years all that little like crazy stuff that new orleans saints do so that they right. you know continue to push off the cap explosion uh to year after year after year and then he also you know has to do some of the more day-to-day things now too you know uh training facilities looking at overhauling and leading certain things in terms of renovations like all those other sort of like day-to-day tasks that we don't think about he now also has to open his scope to so it depends on what the structure is for atlanta if the structure of the philosophy of the team is going to be dictated by the new head coach that comes in then he's going to do a really great job at leading two departments draft or let me say college scouting and pro scouting that are going to be able to identify the appropriate talent and the appropriate fits for that if he's tasked with building the culture then he's going to bring a lot of what you see in new orleans with him and then see exactly where the nuance is there in terms of what the terry Fontenot style ends up being but that would be a big question mark just in terms of what that looks like all right now here's my other question yeah here's my other question because i really thought that y'all was willing to just you know not give up but just Allow Jeff Ireland to walk more so with Terry Fortnite. Mm-hmm. And I know Fortnite been there for a long time, and you just yeah. don't really just get rid of. I ain't, yeah, I ain't get rid of him, but right. you just don't. You try to keep. You try to make him happy, keep him there. Because yeah. you see a lot of people, like a lot of scouters, national scouters, stay with teams for years, and and like you got people there in New England. Mm-hmm. You know, as a national scouter, been working with Belichick and Parcells for years, but he's not going nowhere anytime soon. Right. But that's that's very similar to Terry Fortnite. Mm-hmm. And I was I was shocked that when we said that his name was on the on the docket to be interviewed, I'm like, oh man, this, I said like this is kind of, this could be better than Jeff Island because yeah. I did a show on Jeff Island you know a few weeks ago and mm-hmm. I thought Island was gonna be more so coming here to be interviewed and pro- possibly be the GM over Terry, mm-hmm. but you know I think this is a better you know situation for us. Yeah, I, I think so, too. Um, here's here's what I'll say, too, when it comes down to Jeff Ireland and Terry Fontenot. Uh, Terry, Jeff Ireland has been there before. He has been a general manager before. 
generally it's hard, especially when you have a negative experience as a general manager to erase people, to erase teams memories of that. And Jeff Ireland did not have a very successful tenure as a general manager. I believe it was in Miami, if I remember correctly, uh, that did not go extremely well for him. So I think that it's harder to erase that Terry Fontenot instead being a young up and comer that, you know, was with the new Orleans Saints franchise for over 15 years. Like you mentioned, he's literally from Louisiana. He's from Lake Charles. Like he's from Southwest Louisiana. Yeah, uh, like he's, Louisiana. You know what I mean? Yeah. So he, he had like really strong ties with the organization, but there was a reason that they promoted him up to, instead of being a director of pro personnel, they promoted him up to assistant VP as well as uh, assistant general manager of pro personnel. They were grooming him to be able to advance his career. And unfortunately for the saints, that means, that means two things. This is a guy that they believe in and they believed deserved a shot as a general manager in the NFL. So they promoted him in order to help build his resume to that level to where he would get that consideration or to assist him in getting that situation. But also there was nowhere else to promote him aside from like retitling Mickey Loomis and then promoting him up to general manager and then promoting Terry Fontenot up to general manager. There was no real way to kind of leverage anything to say, no, 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 stay here in New Orleans, if that makes sense. This is a great opportunity for Terry Fontenot. Everybody believes in him. And that, that became more paramount to the Saints who already have probably a plan in place to replace him because – He's been there for 16 years, which means the rhythm, the cadence in terms of the way that they study, the way that they look at pro personnel, like the way that they look at these players, they've got somebody that's probably ready to come up from within the organization that knows that same system, that same situation pretty well. So they'll be fine, but it does hurt them. There's no doubt about that. It hurts New Orleans to lose Terry Fontenot. But I think that because you're talking about, you know, players that are going to be professional guys that have been playing for, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years versus the three to four year turnover of college scouting, it's a little bit more important to maintain consistency across college scouting than it is to maintain across pro scouting. All right. Um, I had a question for my uh, co-host, Kings Rim. Mm -hmm. He said um, he missed it, but he said, who has he drafted or has his hands on draft with drafting? I don't think he has dealt with anything. Have he dealt with anything with the draft? He, he doesn't he doesn't deal with any of that selection process. He he helps once those players get drafted to get them into their fits, get them into the system. That's the next part that he does. But everything in terms of uh, drafting and, and player acquisition in the draft is Jeff Ireland. That's all his stuff. Okay. But some of the players that you can point to for Terry Fontenot in terms of leading the charge on when it comes to signings, uh, Emmanuel Sanders this past season, uh, of course, uh, Demario Davis uh, here yeah. recently, which was a huge, huge, signing. Yeah. 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 huge signing for him. And then again, all of the player retention that they've been able to do in terms of keeping players in the building, Taysom Hill, David Onyemata, who was going to be a free agent last season that they managed to re-sign on a very cheap three-year deal. So a lot of that in terms of retaining the team and keeping consistency over this 2017 to 2019, or excuse me, 2020 period, he had a very played a very large role in that. All right, I'm gonna add to that. So he hasn't had any like um, experience in draft or well, the draft of college scouting. Do you think he'll probably bring a scouter from the Saints over to be the director of college uh, scouting? Here's it's possible. It's possible. He could bring, you know, oftentimes when you see people get hired as general managers, they bring yeah. scouts with them or they bring people in the system, and that's absolutely possible. Right. I don't think he'll bring Jeff Ireland with him, yeah, but he, he can bring, you know. We good. Man, you, got the, you got a question for him? Um, he pretty much uh, answered it. Um, as far as, so basically what you're saying is, is he, he's more so the cap guy to kind of bring in uh, to kind of manipulate the cap, bringing this guy, retain this guy, uh, for the most part. Yeah, I, I would I would put more focus on identification and retention. Those are kind of his, his biggest things. Okay. He does have some part in contract negotiations, but in terms of like manipulating cap and everything like that, that comes down to Mickey Loomis and Kai Hartley, who's the capologist okay. in the room. It really that really comes down to them. But he does have obviously the experience of working with those two, which I think will benefit him in his in this position. All right, David, you got your question asked. So he just asked, he just he asked about the cap, so he just answered your question. So, all right. Mm -hmm. um, so, I want to address this question real quick, mm -hmm. um, and I just want you to be honest. Like I understand yeah. you're a Saints fan, and you know I know we we don't like y'all. Y'all don't like us. We just keep it one hundred. <laughs> <laughs> I like y'all. But I like y'all, but that's fine. That's fine. Man, come on, man. Let's not be political correct now. <laughs> man, y'all don't to play that. Don't play that. Don't <laughs> so, uh, Matt Ryan, 
right. This mm-hmm. has been the huge topic for the past couple of years here in Atlanta. Matt Ryan, a lot of the fans saying that, and then you got people here that reports on the Falcons who I'm gonna be honest, they do a good job. Um, they said that we should move on from Matt Ryan. And they said, mm-hmm. well, if we have a new GM in here, then we'll move on from him and draft a quarterback. Do you think mm-hmm. Terry Fortnight would do something like that? Um, that that to me is something that the general manager may take the lead, like a new general manager coming in. No general man, new general manager wants to walk in and trade the starting quarterback. That is not the first thing that a general manager wants to do. They don't, you know what I mean? Like you can look at the you can look at the new general manager going in at uh in Detroit. Like homeboy doesn't want to be the dude that trades away Matt Stafford. You know what I'm saying? Hey, like, especially no, a good, yeah. especially a good quarterback. Matt Ryan right, is an right. elite yeah. quarterback. Like, why would you want to get rid of this guy? Yeah. So so it, it really it really comes down it really comes down to the direction. I would look more to Arthur Blank in that situation. It's going to kind of come down to the direction that the team ownership wants to go in. And then after that, it comes down to the general manager to make that happen. So I don't think that any general manager is going to walk in and say, all right, time to, you know, sell everything out and like fire sale everybody. Let's move Julio. Let's move Matt Ryan. Like that's not a great way to start off the situation. Most of the time no. you, you you accept a job like the Atlanta Falcons job because they have those players, right? Because they have Calvin Ridley, Julio Jones, Matt Ryan, things like that. So I don't know that there's going to really be a rush or a push from Terry Fontenot in particular to do that. But if it does come from ownership or elsewhere within the organization, if that's the direction that they want to go, then it'll be up to him to make the best of that situation. Good. That, that that right there, we we miss, we have been saying this for a long time. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh Kings Real says since he doesn't have since he doesn't really draft, are you worried about him in this year's draft? Yeah, I think that's gonna be the big the biggest question, right? Is what is going to be the what is gonna be the effect of widening his scope? Uh and also because he comes from an organization that delegates those responsibilities. Will he also delegate those responsibilities so that maybe what you sim- maybe what you simply see is a static return in terms of what the drafting has already been for Atlanta, which has been decent. Like I don't think there's anything really to. Mm-hmm. There have been some like maybe some, maybe you'll see more mobility in the draft in terms of trading and things like that. Maybe yeah. he brings that philosophy with him. But I think for the most part, like there's not a ton that you have to really adjust about the Atlanta Falcons' ability to draft. Like they're they've been pretty steady there. So I think that for him it's going to come down to whether or not he wants to delegate that to the people that are already there and already handling. And maybe he brings a little bit of a different approach or philosophy to it or a a different system for identifying the talent, like maybe a different criteria. But in terms of the decisions that are made, I think you'll still see a pretty consistent rhythm in in terms of what you see. I don't think you'll see a big shift. I'm I'm cutting this out. I'm cutting this out right here. Exactly. Like, yeah. People been saying, "Oh, GM, he gonna want to draft." I'm like, "Come on, we already got people here in places already scouting talent right. in college." That's, right yeah, like the the general management position is one that can absolutely be one that walks in and absolutely like tears everything up and then reinstitutes a whole new thing. It, it, I'm not gonna say that that's not possible, right? Obviously, that's possible, but. For somebody that's coming in like that and for somebody that's taking the job as a first time general manager, he may make a, a different decision, which is to rely on the delegation that's already in place and then just introduce new criteria, introduce sort of new uh, rubric for you know scouting these guys and getting more information on them. Maybe he stresses a little bit more the culture. Maybe he stresses a little bit more. You know, it brings a little bit of a different philosophy. But for the most part, like that's usually delegated. The GM oversees those things, but because that scope is so wide, all the way down to hey, we need to renovate the bathrooms and the training facility. <laughs> like the general manager has to be concerned with those types of things for player retention and making sure that there's nothing that's going to deter uh, you know players for sticking around or, or joining the franchise that he's going to rely, I imagine, on a delegation that either is already in place or one that he recreates. All right. So David said the real question is, will he look in the future while retaining Matt? That's any That's any GM. Any GM will yeah. look into the future. You don't just be right. satisfied with what you have. And then he just, just on Matt Ryan. Right now, we know our biggest issue right now has been defense and running the ball. So that mm-hmm. right there is going to be addressed this offseason. Yeah. Go ahead, Matt, Mike. Um, as far as his philosophy, does he, is he one of those GMs or, um, because the Falcons have had issues, um, in particular on the defensive side of the ball, whether or not they want to be a three, four or four, three style defense is, is, does he favor uh, a particular style of defense? Uh, the only thing I can do 
in that, I think he'll probably, again, if that philosophy is set by the coach, by the new head coach coming in or the defensive coordinator, then he would help to support that and, and identify players that fit in that role. But when it comes down to what they did in, with the New Orleans Saints, it's a multiple front set. They'll play, you know, three down linemen for dime sets on third down, but then they'll also play that in, you know, two minute situations and, you know, in up tempo offense situations when they're going up against those. But for the most part, they'll stick around with four defensive linemen and try not to send a fifth on blitzing if they don't have to. So if you try to, you know, if you want to look at what they did in New Orleans and then assume that that'll be part of the philosophy that he brings with him, that would probably be the system he'd be most familiar with. But also because of that, he's familiar in terms of what kind of talent is needed for those odd man fronts as well as those four man fronts. Okay. Uh, do you think the Saints will be looking towards their future at quarterback in this draft? They better be looking into the future at quarterback in every <laughs> draft. <laughs> 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 which, which is going to be an interesting thing, right, to see how Terry Fontenot takes that philosophy over where the Saints haven't ever really addressed quarterback in the draft, right? Yeah. That's not something that they've really put a focus on. Two, I believe it's two quarterbacks that have been drafted in the Saint, in, in Sean Payton's tenure. Since Chase Daniels right. and Taysom Hill, that's it. Chase Daniels right. and Taysom Hill. Yeah, and I mean, like, and those guys weren't even drafted. Like, those, they, those guys came in as free agents. You know what I mean? So that was like a part of Terry Fontenot, right? Especially, well... Yeah. Taysom Hill was entirely was entirely Sean Payton, but Terry Fontenot played a role in retention and things like that with him. But when it comes down to maybe a philosophy that he brings with him, is he somebody that says, hey, we never did this in New Orleans. We should look at addressing quarterback and looking and, and just having a future quarterback that we look at in drafts more often than not. Like maybe they do put an extra focus on that because they didn't in New Orleans. It depends on how he feels about that philosophy going in. All right. Dwayne, so, he, he he said something key. You say that that Taysom Hill wasn't totally Sean Payton's. No, no, I, I said Tay, I said Taysom Hill was entirely Sean Payton because Sean Payton went to go okay, and scout okay. somebody else. He went to go scout a receiver uh, at a at a Green Bay game, I believe it was a preseason game, if I remember correctly. And then he saw Taysom okay. Hill play, and he was like, "Uh, that guy." And then he really okay. pushed for Taysom Hill to be there. But Terry Fontenot, of course, played a role in retaining him when it came to you know dealing with the new contract, his expiring stuff, things like that. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. All right, Dwayne said, "I think the best thing for him to do is come in right out the gate." Trade for the second pick. What second pick are you talking about? The second talking, overall pick. If you're talking about for the New York Jets. Then that's somebody that's interested in addressing quarterback. It sounds like. Why are we moving up two spots? <laughs> <laughs> We're giving right, away capital. We barely, we barely have, have money we, as it we, is. We, Why we, we, we got so many holes and stuff on the defense and everything. Why are we giving away capital that we need? And now he said, get his franchise QB. Then see who really has, uh, who really think will well, be. We learn anything from the Saints. The Saints okay. are a perfect example of extent. If really just extending one's career, like this is a perfect example. Why are we so quick to draft a quarterback? And you have a great quarterback in Drew Brees and Matt Ryan. Have a guy like Taysom Hill who can be a mobile quarterback who can do some things outside of just being that and. And, and wait a couple of years. When Drew Brees retired, when Matt Ryan says that he wants to retire, that's when you start the draft process. But, like, this is a perfect he opportunity. Uh, you saw it with the Saints. They just focus on building their defense. And that's look it. what they're at right now. Yeah, yeah. Defense, defense and, then, and offensive line. Like, those yeah, are the that's, and that's what you want for an aging quarterback. A better defense, a and better offensive line. line to keep it clean. And right. that's what y'all did. Y'all went 79 for three years straight. Yep. Y'all could have easily drafted Deshaun Watson in 2017 because I thought that was, yeah. that's the direction that y'all was going to go. Me too. But y'all yeah. didn't. Y'all 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 got Marshawn Lattimore, and then y'all went back in the first round and got um, Ramsack, yep. uh, which has been a huge piece of y'all offensive line. Cute. Um, and then ever since then, y'all been NFC South champions because yeah. y'all had a top, y'all got a top 10 defense, and y'all got one of the best line in mm -hmm. football. That's what we've been trying to tell mm -hmm. the Fox fans. Like, if we just build our offensive line and you get a defense, we'll be good. Right. That's the weapons, it. The skill possession weapons are there. There's no doubt about that. And you have a you have a quarterback that obviously knows the system. I mean, the system was built around Matt Ryan, was built with Matt Ryan for that matter. Yeah, yeah. I, I I I see it similarly to to you guys. I, I don't see anything wrong with like at if you're sitting at four and you know. Uh, a quarterback that this team really, really likes is on the board, and then they take that quarterback. I don't think there's anything wrong with that, but I think moving up and then giving up capital to go and grab a quarterback that you might like, a little bit of a different story. But if somebody's there at four and they're like, let's just have this, let's just stockpile Zach Wilson. 
for instance, or let's stockpile, you know, X, Y, and Z, whatever this quarterback is. I get that. I get that idea, but moving up, probably not the, not the solution. Exactly. All right. Kingsbury said, what flaws do you see him as a GM? I think that the biggest thing is going to be the inexperience at, for the other parts of the job. Uh, you know, I keep, I keep using the phrase, but widening the scope, right? He's been, he's been focusing on pro personnel for most of his career with the new Orleans saints. Obviously he's been learning from other people. He's been working closely with Jeff Ireland because he's part of that sort of triumvirate him, Jeff Ireland, Mickey Loomis. So obviously he's learning from those guys. So he has experience and exposure to those other roles, but that would be my biggest question mark of him would be, can he expand a little bit in terms of like what his focus is outside of pro personnel, what he's been doing for the new Orleans saints. All right. David said, what role did Joe Brady, Joe Brady was an offensive assistant. Yeah. Joe Brady. Uh, I, you want to be a hundred percent real? You're good. <laughs> Joe be Brady real. made copies. Joe Brady made copies. Like Joe Brady was, <laughs> <laughs> that's what Joe Brady did. That's what Joe Brady did in new Orleans. Like I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to disparage him. I'm not trying to disparage him, but like in new he Orleans, that Z -box the, he hit that Z -box the playbook. <laughs> right. Like that's, that was, that was his role in new Orleans because he started off. Oh, very man, young, right. right? <laughs> yeah. <I'm not laughs> like I'm not trying to, disparage him at so, all and then uh, he did a really good job beyond that like picking up what sean payton was doing with his system and everything then he went to lsu and then got more exposure there in terms of uh, his ability as a passing game coordinator where he mostly focused working not with the quarterbacks but with the wide receivers which is very important and then he was able to develop his own system from there but when he was with new orleans he just did a very good job soaking up information being a sponge and being proactive while being the guy that made copies i mean it, it's an incredible story what he's done so far all right, so <laughs> let me get, let me get, let me give you uh, let me ask you give your take real quick because everybody's saying that Terry Fortno and Joe Brady they look they may be combined as a GM mm -hmm. head coach. Um, I, Brady, I, I live in I I'll be alright with it, mm -hmm. but my thing is he's still to me he he's not proven yet. Um, right, just like you know Sean McVay was or whatever, but mm -hmm. at least McVay coached in the NFL a little right. longer. You know, as an OC, yeah. but who would you pick as a head coach? Would you pick Joe Brady or would it be Arthur Smith? Because we interviewed Arthur Smith twice already. Yeah, I mean, I'm gonna I'm gonna be 100 real with you. My best pick for Atlanta and the guy that I've wanted to see be the head coach for Atlanta in this coaching cycle was Eric Bieniemy. That's the guy that I've been very excited wow. about. For New why? Why? Because yeah. Simply. simply no, the only reason why I said that is because like the system is perfect for what he likes to do. Wide zone offense brings something in. Arthur Smith is the same thing. Arthur Smith is going to bring a wide zone focus. He's going to bring that sort of college feeling system to it. So Arthur Smith's not a bad choice. But Eric Bieniemy was somebody that I really looked at and was like, he would be a really good fit in terms of being somebody that can work with Matt Ryan, being somebody that can work with these receivers and then maximize tight end presence, things like that. So he would just get a little bit more from the skill position players on offense than I think maybe Matt Smith will. Matt Smith is going to maximize maximize the quarterback to me eric bien maximizes all of the skill position players it, it's just a it's just a style thing it's just a fit thing that's all that it was yeah. but out of the two i would i personally lean towards arthur smith out of, out of joe brady and arthur smith i lean arthur smith more experience more exposure things like that joe brady's ascension has been awesome it's been incredible to watch but he's got one year of experience as a as a coordinator right. in the nfl and you're trying to work off of that. And he was, and I know that people are looking at like the 2009 LSU offense and saying, look, this was the best college football team at that time or whatever, like throughout that season. Some people look at it as the best college football team of all time. But when you look at it, it comes down to him working very closely with Steve Insminger, who was doing all of the offensive coordination, who was doing all of the install. He worked mostly as a passing game coordinator with the wide receivers. So you can only take so much from that, right? It's like saying, oh, it's a co-coordinator position for lack of better phrases. So I think that that would be my thing, would be leaning toward Arthur Smith as a more proven guy in the NFL, especially when you already have a first-time GM. Pairing that with a first-time head coach can be a little volatile. Okay. Uh, I, yeah, I've just never been high on, on, on Airbnb, man. Just that's he fine. Not call, yeah, he's not calling the plays out there, and I don't think we're going to end up hiring him. It's, I think it's going to come down to either it's going to be Brady, um, Arthur Smith, and we don't know about Brandon Staley. Um, he mm -hmm. may end up following Brad Holmes out there in Detroit right now. Yeah, which would make a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah. All right. So, thank you, David. Man, appreciate you. We definitely appreciate it. But yeah, but uh, but yeah, but here's the thing. 
All right, Terry Fortino pretty much going to end up being hired as a, the Atlanta Falcons GM, hopefully by the end of the day or next week, but not next week, tomorrow, but we won't, it won't be official to after you guys, I guess, lose this weekend. <laughs> yeah, from Monday. But yeah, but like, do you think, do you, so you think, him coming here is the best fit, or do you think him going to a different team will, you know, will maximize him? I I think I think going to Atlanta makes a ton of sense for him. Um, it's it's a team that he's familiar with because he's had to build a team. He had he's had to build a team that had right. to be against him twice a season every year that he has been <laughs> with the new Orleans Saints system. Right. right? Uh, you know, the, the expansion mm-hmm. was a 2000 and tw- 2002 for the NFC South. And, and so you, even after, and then he came on after that. And so for 16 years, he has been a part of a franchise that has been focused on building a team that's had to go up against this team twice a season. So with right. that, I, I think that that, I think this is a great opportunity for him because he's familiar. He knows what they want to do. He knows how to go against it as well, which I think can be equally of value. Uh, I think this is a better fit for him than maybe some of the other positions that are open, especially as a first-time guy. Yeah, I know I heard some people on Twitter say, well, hire him. He's going to be like a spy, and he's going to get the Saints. I'm like, we haven't been good for, for the past, what, few years? What, what yeah. is he going to be, y'all? Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think I think the thing is, is that, yes, he's going to bring some knowledge of the system with him, but the focus is going to be on – maximizing the talent that's already there and then building the team before essentially being more concerned about what another franchise is doing. It's going to be insular. It's going to be, how do we revolutionize or change what is happening here within the Atlanta Falcons and make this product better as opposed to focusing on what the other team is doing. You always build, you know, divisional teams are built to win the division. So you always build your team to compete against the teams in the division. So there's always going to be some value in having that knowledge. It's an arms Yeah, you know what I mean? It's an arms exactly, race. Exactly, you know? exactly. So if you get caught up on what they're doing over there, you're missing what you right. need to be doing right here, which is what I think he'll be focused on. All right. All right. Any more questions, uh, Matt, Mike? Um, I think you pretty much – um, you know, uh, I had one major, um, yeah, I think you pretty much got it all, um, outside of that. Yeah, I'm cool. Cool. Man, I just appreciate it. I appreciate it, man. I, I definitely, um, enjoyed the show. You gave us pretty much everything that we needed to know about Terry right. Fortino. Um, that's something that we've, uh, under Thomas Dimitrov, if you um, pay the attention to the Falcons. Tommy Dimitrov has been horrible with retaining True. players and yes. which, yeah. you know, the type of players that we you need to to either retain or decide to let go. So I think this is an excellent hire, man, to be honest. So I yeah. appreciate Look at, it. For, for example, of course. Of course. For, for <laughs> example, Justin Zimmer. We we um we brought in Justin Zimmer a couple of seasons ago. Uh, don't let this man go. This man up in Buffalo balling. I'm like, yeah. Yeah, I mean it, it's that kind of thing, right? You have to have you have to have the the sort of foresight aspect of everything. What does a player look like right mm-hmm. now? But also, what can he look like very soon in this system? And, and everything has to be under. Right. And I think I think it goes without saying, but everything has to be under the scope of what the system and philosophy is for the individual franchise, mm-hmm. right? So you know, somebody works somewhere else doesn't necessarily mean that they would have worked where you are. But are you able to do that? The thing that New Orleans Saints have done very well and that they've talked about very publicly is that no player ever shows up in New Orleans unless there is a specific plan for how they fit. It's not like the New England yeah. Patriots to where like wide receiver three has a binder and that's what that that's what that role is always doing in the system. It's more so how do we maximize these players within our system? And so not our, I don't work for the team, but you know what I mean, within the New Orleans Saints system. And so it, it, it comes down to that. And I think Terry Fontenot will bring that philosophy. Again, I think it's a great hire. I think it's a really, really good opportunity for Terry Fontenot. I'm very glad to see him get it. Like to see a brother in that in that role as well as a general manager. Like that's incredibly important, and I'm so glad to see that for him. Uh, I think that the other the, the the question marks are only how does he adjust to the things that he hasn't had to be you know a huge part of that he's played a role in and that he's been around him. That's going to be the thing to watch. Yeah. How does he how does he operate in the draft? How does he operate as the general manager when it comes to uh, focusing on contract negotiations, uh, wider aspect of player retention, staff retention, things like that? Like it just widens the scope for him. So the only question mark is going to be yes, he does some of the things that maybe Dimitrov didn't do as well, 
but then can he balance it back out to hit a wider scope of things? That would be the big question. All right, Reggie, I understand what y'all saying about Arthur Smith. I know the run game got shut down by Baltimore, but guys, look, it happens, y'all. It's That's football. You right. know, like, this doesn't mean y'all, y'all looking at one game and y'all saying that, oh, this man ain't going to be a good coach. Yeah. I would also stress, too, that, like, no offense, but Atlanta, no team, no team in the NFL aside from Tennessee has a Derrick Henry. Exactly. And so no team right. is going to be as focused on building around their running back to the extent that – you know, their entire offense is predicated on if Derrick Henry is running, then the passing game can work. And I don't think Atlanta has that problem. The passing game is always going to work for Atlanta. But now even it's still, about what else he brings? But even still, Tannehill is looking real good in Tennessee. Yes. You know, yes. he, he's his numbers is matching uh, Pat Mahomes twenty the past twenty four games. So yeah. if you match Pat Mahomes, you got to be doing something right. A hundred percent, hundred percent. And uh, all I'm saying is that like Tannehill is boosted by the presence of like play action and, and the way that all of that works, which is all a part of Arthur Miller's system. Matt Ryan doesn't necessarily need that to be productive. And I think that's a benefit for Atlanta. If you get a guy like Arthur Smith who can implant that, but also has a quarterback that can take over a game and that can win you a game, which I don't know that Ryan Tannehill can do as we've seen if the running game gets taken out. Matt Ryan doesn't have that problem. And I think that helps Arthur Smith. All right. Mm -hmm. All right, Rose said, but Terry, but can Terry bring in people to help with what he's lacking? Yeah, he'll do that. Yeah. You know, you got to, if you, if you want to be successful as a GM, you got to bring in people who are going to help you. You can't just be bringing in your cousin down the street, you know, that y'all play, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, eat, throw them up, eat them up. You got to bring in somebody who knows their stuff. Right. You know? So uh, once again, a, a, another aspect of a lot of people, they don't know that each organization has their own scouting department to begin with. So he's going right. to bring in guys that are asset to him where he right. can, you know, you know, feel his and, and, and he kind of take over for what the Falcons are, you know, what they want of him. They asking of him. So uh, that that's important for a lot of people to know. A lot of people just think, okay, the GM is, is the guy that's going to, you know, handle the draft and free agency. There are, like I said, Every team has their scouting department. Right. Yeah. It, it'll be his job to essentially like take all of them and then create a, a cohesive and um, and consistent focus. That's that's going to be basically right. his biggest thing, because I know that there's also already I'm just looking at the uh, the executive branch for the Falcons. But when it comes down to like pro and draft personnel like there's already people in those positions um shepley heard as the director of pro personnel anthony robinson the director of college scouting so if those two are retained and are not replaced by um you know somebody that maybe fontenot feels more comfortable with which is entirely possible but his job will be to take all of those different perspectives and then turn it toward the team philosophy to make sure everything is consistent so if there's been anywhere that you're seeing that they're lacking in that in that consistency he becomes sort of the driving force behind making it consistent. I think we keep it after the Robinson. I don't think he's going anywhere. Um, that, would be, that would be that would be smart. <laughs> yeah. Cortez said, "Do you think this hire will bring the fan base back together? Because it's been a man. Look, let me tell y'all something. Two things. <laughs> look, two things is what's wrong with this franchise. The first thing is when we drafted Vic." Everybody lost their dog on minds. Everybody <laughs> think that every quarterback after Vic should be just like this man. This is why we keep getting the Justin Fields, even people up here capping for a dog on Dwayne Haskins to come to Atlanta. Like, come on now. Y'all need to just stop it. Hey, what's the uh, quarterback for we signed? I forget his name. Um, the quarterback uh, from the Patriots that the Falcons signed. Oh, it was uh, Danny, Danny quarterback. Yeah, Danny 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 Danny. Danny. Hey, we brought him in. We wanted him to be the starter. We wanted him to run the quarterback so bad. Like, this is what Falcons fans are. So there's no hope for us. Man, we want, Dominique, we want a Dominique Franks to be the, to be the quarterback. Like, <laughs> oh my god! And the second thing is us losing that 2016 Super Bowl because after that Super Bowl, we thought we was the team to be, and we didn't even win anything. Yeah. So I don't look the fan, I don't know, man. I don't know if this if this if this uh, fan base could ever be on the United front because everybody wants such and such. Everybody wants flash. You got people like us who 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 knows what we need to be successful, but you know people are not about their life. You know they're not about drafting a, a PDC well to help your offensive line get better. Y'all want just the fields. 
for some reason. I don't know. I don't know why. So, hey, it is what it is. <laughs> but once again, man, appreciate you coming on, man. Uh, once again, let oh, everybody yeah. know who you are and where they can find you at again. Yeah, absolutely, man. Uh, pleasure to be here with you. I appreciate y'all. Uh, thanks for having me on. And I I'm looking forward to seeing how this works out because, again, I'm a big fan of Terry Fontenot. So I I'm excited to see him get this opportunity. Uh, if y'all are interested, you can follow me on Twitter at Ross Jackson. Nola, uh, I if you don't follow me, it's okay. I understand. I cover the Saints. You probably hate that. I don't mind. It's fine. But I'm just going to tell you. Ross Jackson, Nola, and you can catch the podcast uh, every day, Monday through Friday, over at Locked on Saints, and as well as all the write-ups over at Canal Street Chronicles. Again, if you don't check it out, it's okay. I understand. I'm not mad at you, but I, I appreciate y'all so much, man. Thanks man, for having me. Y'all need to go follow, go follow the man. Y'all need – look, I understand some people <laughs> follow the man. I got you. I, got I, you. I, look, I, I support anybody. I need an insider. We need yeah. an insider, so I, insider. I'm definitely going to follow I appreciate y'all. I I am not I am not the uh, I am not an incendiary <laughs> person. That's not who I am. <laughs> yeah, long as you ain't TJ no, TJ Jones, I'm cool with TJ Jones. He all right. Uh, TJ but, TJ no. <laughs> yeah, he, he, he could clown oh, but still at the same time. But I'm I'm gonna go support my I'm gonna support brothers anyway because we do need to support each other. Uh, People need to understand that. Absolutely. Yep. So yep. Hundred percent. I appreciate y'all, man. Thank you. Take care. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. So, all right. Hey, if anybody uh, watching this at, uh, at a later time, please let us know um, in the comment section. Uh, do you think Terry uh, Fortnite would be a uh, a good uh, be a good GM for us, or do you think, oh man, we need Lewis Riddick? Whatever the case, man, whatever comment you want, just swing it our way. All right. Also, um, if you're new to the channel, make sure you hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, share this content out with other Atlanta sports fanatics. As always, come holler. At your hometown sports podcast. It's your boy the Dunn. He with my partner in crime, Matt Mike from Matt Mike Sports. Y'all have a great afternoon. And we'll see y'all later on tonight with the King's Rim and the Dunn's favor covering the playoff games uh, for this weekend. Today, y'all stay safe. Hey. Five K five.